Hallelujah. The song says, strongholds are still being loosed. Once again, we worship him for who he is, and when we do, a direct result of that is strongholds are break, broken. Hallelujah. We don't worship him to break the strongholds. We worship him because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We worship him because he sent his son, his only son, to die on a cross, to be buried in a grave, and to resurrect. We worship him for who he is, and as a result, strongholds are being loosed. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Does anybody get excited about worshiping God? Does anybody get excited when you worship him and you feel his presence overwhelm you? You feel his presence consume your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's multiple ways to worship Jesus Christ. We can do it in singing. We can do it in playing instruments. We can do it in the way we express our worship. We can do it in prayer. We can do it in fasting. We can do it in our relationship. And we can also worship God in returning what he has blessed us with and our finances, our offerings, and our tithes. And this time we're gonna allow the opportunity to return your tithes and offerings to God, not because this church or this pastor or the Bible demands it, we're not demanding anybody to do anything, but we are returning to God what he has blessed us with. It's an act of worship. And a result of that is that you and your family is going to be blessed because of your faithfulness and your worship of returning your tithes and offering. Bow your heads this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful presence you have placed in this sanctuary today. Lord, I thank you for everyone that is here in person with us at our Dents Run campus and those that are watching online. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will bless this offering. Bless everyone that is able to give, Lord. I pray that they will receive blessings from you, Lord, just from the obedience and their worship of returning what you have blessed them with, God. Lord, I pray that you continue, Lord, to have the praises of your people as we exalt and glorify your name. Lord, we ask that you would continue to do your work today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we need a move of your spirit, we need a move.
hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God. I'm not preaching on this today, but it's for next week, but I'm going to go ahead and ask the question today. How many, how many want to see revival? So a good portion of the church wants to see revival. How many like praise reports? I very much believe, and I'm very, very careful when I, I've always been this way, my father was this way as well. But Friday, we went and baptized, Chad did the baptizing. went into the home. Some of you may have seen it. I posted it on Facebook. We baptized Jackie Lucas in her garden tub in her home. I very much believe that is the start of revival in this church right there. I just, I feel it so strongly. I feel it so strongly. Not only does Chad and Ashley have four kids, that whole family, I think there's 900 of them that extend out. And that was, that was part of the family. A revival is a, a bringing back to life. Her husband Dean's had the Holy Ghost, right? So that means it's still there, he's still got it. It just hasn't been active. I feel it so strongly. I don't want, I don't want to go from this point until the trumpet sounds and just go through the motions. That's not what I want to do. I, I don't. I don't want to celebrate 90 years as a church and and say, "Hey, we're doing great," which we are, impacting the community, which we are. But I want this to be the greatest portion of the history of this church, starting now, starting now, starting now. And and don't worry, Bishop would be okay with that. He'd be fine with that. He'd be okay when we all get to heaven and we get to introduce hundreds of people that he didn't know that came into the faith 
because we were all about revival and harvest. That's next week's sermon. Just an appetizer today. I'm telling you, if you want revival, we will see revival. And we're going to talk about it next week. But just get yourself prepared. Get your heart and mind prepared. We are going to see revival and we are going to see things happen in this place that have never happened before. That song was talking about it. The blind eyes being opened, deaf ears being opened. I want to see that. I want to see that firsthand. I don't want to see it in a missionary report, which, yes, I still want to see that, but that's not the only place I want to see it. I want to see it firsthand, right here, right here. Brother Davis, we've been praying for his eye, left eye, and you can now see more clearly, right? Praise God. Praise God. Alexa Johnson, we can now say it publicly. She is with child. And I, I asked her this morning, just to clarify, medical professionals told you that you would not be able to have a child. Is that correct? But God. But God. But God. But God. And just, just to warn some of you ladies, we have, I think we have eight ladies pregnant in the church right now. There's something in the water, so be careful. Candace is only allowed to drink soda for the next few months. God is at work in this church. And we are not going to be satisfied with status quo. We are not going to be satisfied with just marking attendance, which we need to. I'll be talking about that. It's very important. The house of God is very important. But we are not going to be satisfied with just that. We will not be satisfied until heaven comes down and just blows us away. On the day of Pentecost, a mighty rushing wind filled the house where they were sitting, waiting on the presence of God, praying and seeking, obeying what Jesus told them to do. That obedience turned into turning the world upside down because God said, I will send my spirit, my comforter to be with you. Praise God. Man, I got to get to my sermon. Thank you for being in the house of God today. Thank, thank you to everyone that was uh, here Friday evening for our time of fellowship, our cornhole tournament. That was great. We, uh, we played cornhole music, Christian country. It just, it just fit right in. Uh, I believe, Ch Chad, were you and Caleb the winners? Chad and Caleb won that tournament. Um, wow, I heard some, heard some booze there. Was he, was he using chalk on the bags or something? Like, so we'll have to have another one. Um, but great time of fellowship. If you miss it, I'm sorry you weren't able to be there, uh, but we're going to be doing uh, more of those. And, and uh, just, it was wonderful to get together. Uh, church family, get together. Um, just, just, it's like a good old picnic, coming together and to uh, just to reassure each other, hey, I got your back. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to fight for you. Thank you for being in the house of God today. Those that are our online campus. Thank you for watching, being a part of, and commenting, and participating, and worshiping in your home. I want to turn initially before you're seated to the book of 
Psalms, Psalm chapter number 46. Psalm 46, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. We're seeing that right now. We're seeing that around the world. Verse 7 says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse 11 says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Turn to your neighbor before you're seated. Ask them, who is your refuge? Who is your refuge? You may be seated today. How many in here today have a very present problem? One person. Wow. I'll ask it again now that you guys are seated and not fidgeting and stuff. How many in here have a very present problem? Man, some of you don't have any problem. That's incredible. Wow. You should write a book and let me know how you do that. Ben, I need your help today. It's pick on Ben Day, I guess. I'll be kind, I'll be kind though. So just, just walk with me, follow me. I really like this guy being around, multiple reasons. And he comes to me after, after every service and, and asks, Pastor, is there anything you need? Every service, Pastor, is there anything you need? Most of the time, I don't, occasionally there is. But imagine, imagine you're out walking with your friend and you're walking in a rough part of town and it's, it's getting dark, you're just chatting away and all of a sudden you turn the corner and, and there's an individual, he just looks surly. I know some of you will have to look that word up and be like, what? He just looks surly. And he's got... He's got a gun in his hand. He's got a sneer on his face, and he says, give me all your money. That's a very present problem. You're in the midst of a very present problem. Now, it's nice to have a friend. It's a friend that's strong, a friend that's quick, a friend that's powerful, a friend that's a good marksman, and he also happens to have a gun. And when that surly guy says, give me your money, I turn to my friend and say, how about it? Very present problem. Very present friend. Highly skilled. He can take care of the situation. Thank you. See, I told you I wouldn't embarrass you. God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Would you want your strong, courageous, highly skilled friend at that moment take care of your future problem or would you prefer he take care of your present problem? You want him to take care of the present problem. You don't want to be met with a criminal that's saying, hey, give me your money, and he's got a gun in his hand, and your friend says, hey, I'll, I'll take care, I'll take care of, that, uh, I'll take care of that, that firewood you want me to chop. I'll, I'll get to that next week. Be like, what? I've got a present problem. I need a present God. Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and here's what he says in verses 7 through 10. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. I want to read that section from the Message Bible, and here's how it reads If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. 
We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we are not broken. What did they say? What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. Paul said, hey, listen. Hey, listen. We've got some troubles. We're hard-pressed on every side. Anybody feel like that? Hard-pressed on every side. Enemies just, he's at us constantly. We're perplexed. I'm not sure what to do. We're persecuted. We're struck down. But in all this, we're not crushed. We're not in despair. We're not forsaken. And we're not destroyed. And he says, we know this is how. We know this is how it's going to be since we're living for God. And somebody's like, well, I don't know if I want to live for God if that's going to happen. Hold on. It makes Jesus shine that much more when people look at us. However, in the midst of the trouble, God is on our side. God's going to get the glory for our rescue. And I want to point us to a powerful and familiar scripture found in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? You guys cheating? Oh, yeah, you are. Or did you know that one? God with us. Our living God was named Emmanuel. He was named for the present. He is certainly a God of the past, and he's a God of the future. He's taking care of our past by forgiving us, and he's taking care of our future by giving us a hope. But I'm here to declare to you today that he is absolutely the God of the present. He is my right now God for my right now problem. He's my right now God for my right now problem. Now, a lot of you said, hey, I've got a present problem, a very present problem. He can be your right now God for your right now problem. He's my right now God. Our opening text says God is our refuge. But let me take you to Psalm 23. It begins like this. The Lord is... Oh, it wasn't up there, was it? The Lord is, what's the key word there? My. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's a very personal God. And he'll be there for your very personal problems. We can, we can talk about God being our strength, our hope, our joy, and so on. But if he's our, it also means that he's my. God is our refuge It also, if you're a part of our, if you're in the family of God, you can now say he is my God. Psalm 23 is not an arm's length, past tense, wouldn't it be nice kind of passage. It is personal. It is right here, right now, up close about you and your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Today, I want to remind you that Jesus is a personal God. Psalm 16 and 5 says, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. When you consider the Lord is your portion, you're reminded that he is all you need. God, I, I need a lot. Do you have God? He's all you need. In all the areas of your life where you may feel insufficient or weak, he is enough. He can be all that you need. Psalm 18 and 2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God is a very personal God. 
with the Lord as your rock, you learn that he will stabilize you. He will ground you when life feels shaky. And right now the earth is shaking. People are wondering what in the world's going on. As a Christian, we can look at the word of God and say, I can tell you what's going on. A lot of people don't believe it, but it's in there. It's, it's proven. The earth is shaking, but we can turn to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 27 and 1 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Lots of people fearing for their life in this day and age. But it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When you consider the Lord as your salvation, you take refuge in him, you run to him, and he welcomes you. You say, Dad, I'm coming home. I got to get into the refuge. I got into the place of safety. And Dad's like, come on in. I got room for you. Psalm 28 and 7 says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exalts, and with my song, I shall thank him. We talked about it, God's word for life, praise and worship. We just finished doing some praise and worship. My heart exalts, and with my song, I shall thank him. Why? Because the Lord is my strength. He's my power. He's the glory. He's the lifter up of my head. The Lord is your strength, and he helps you deal with the fears that rise up within you. He gives you what you need to make it through whatever the day brings. We're going to get up tomorrow, and we don't know what tomorrow holds. There are predictors, but we don't know what tomorrow holds. We get up tomorrow, we know that Jesus is our strength. He's the rock that we can stand on. When scripture tells you that the Lord is your shepherd, your portion, your rock, your salvation, and your strength, scripture is shouting the truth with that intensity of a, of a three-year-old that's standing in the middle of the nursery with that little truck in his hand, and he's like, it's mine. And the, and the, the nursery Ministry is like, well, now it, it's, it's everybody's. He's like, it's mine. This is my truck. He didn't bring that truck in there. It's in the room for everybody. But he's got it. He's like, it's mine. We got to have that kind of intensity. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my glory. The Lord is my healer. The Lord is my deliverer. Standing in the middle of the chaos and saying, devil, he's mine. He's mine. The Lord is mine. Let's go back to Psalm 46. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It says God not the postal worker, not the trash picker-upper, not the doctor, not the attorney, not the ice cream truck driver, not the school mascot, not even dad or mom. God, the creator. God is my refuge. Author and theologian A.W. Tozier wrote, the man who comes to a right belief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. For he sees at once that these have to do with matters which at the most cannot concern him for very long. Sovereign appears hundreds of times in scripture and is embedded 6,700 times in the sacred divine name Yahweh. He's sovereign. He's sovereign. God is all powerful. He's everywhere present. The Lord assured the prophet Isaiah in 46 and 10, he said, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times and what is still to come. I say that my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. That is the God that is your shepherd, your personal God. God is yours. And he said, I'll make sure whatever I want to do, whatever I please to do, it's going to happen. And after witnessing a tremendous miracle King Nebuchadnezzar wrote to everyone in his empire. Can you imagine getting this letter from the president? He, the Lord, does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one. So the next time the devil comes and says, hey, I, 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 I can take care of God. No one can hold back the hand of God. The Apostle Paul reaffirmed it in Ephesians 1.11 that God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God can do anything he wants to do. 
your enemy can do nothing about it. All he does is he spends his day whispering over and over a bunch of lies into your life. I got to thinking about it this week. I think too many times we look at that scripture when it talks about Satan roams around like a roaring lion. And then we go, oh man, Satan's a lion. No. He's walking around like a lion. He's an imposter trying to imitate a lion. He is a liar. The first two letters he got right, but then it it drastically changes. He's not a lion, he's a liar. He's gonna whisper lies to you all day long, but you can say, oh, hold on. God is my refuge. God is my refuge. God is my refuge. I'm gonna take a look at Psalm 91, verses one and two. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The psalmist calls God the Most High. The title refers to his position of authority being higher and more respected than all the other so-called gods found among the nations. This psalm is written specifically for those who dwell, linger, abide, spend time in the shelter offered by the Most High God. If you want some protection, you're going to have to spend time in the shelter of the Most High God. You've got to get into that place of refuge. Charles Spurgeon says every child of God looks toward the inner sanctuary and the mercy seat, yet all do not dwell in the most holy place. They run to it at times and enjoy occasional approaches, but they do not habitually reside in that presence. That's what happens. People say, oh, I want to go to the church and I want to be in the presence of God and then I'll skip a couple Sundays. Oh, hey, it sounds like a good day. I'll go to church again and then I'll skip a couple Sundays. And then, oh, well, yeah, maybe I'll make it three or four Sundays. Oh, it's a good day to go back to the house of God. When you reside in the presence of God, staying in that refuge, that place of safety, that security, we have got to spend time in God's presence. Consider this, whether you linger in God's shelter or you just stop in when you feel it's necessary. The promises that follow in the psalm are for those that linger. In Romans chapter eight, verses 38 and 39, we read a list of things that cannot separate us from the love of God. And here's what Paul writes. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Anybody worried about tomorrow? Man, you guys are tougher than, can't get my hand up. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, Paul says. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord, our shepherd, my shepherd, my God. And we can find solace knowing that when we hide in the shelter of the Most High, we will be protected in the midst of all the pain and suffering of this world. We're not going to necessarily be delivered from it. We still have issues. We still have pains. We still got to go to the doctor. We still have all of those things happen, but we will be delivered within it because ultimately the hope of our salvation, when the trumpet sounds and God calls his church, his bride, those that have made themselves ready, those that have stayed within the shelter, the refuge of the Most High God, that trumpet's going to sound and we will be delivered once and for all. But God, God is our refuge. God is my refuge, my refuge. Let's say that together and make it personal. God is my refuge. Now say it like you mean it. God is my refuge. My refuge. A refuge is a shelter or protection from danger. 
a place of safety and security, a, a retreat, a sanctuary, a haven or stronghold. So God is my shelter or protection from danger. He's my place of safety. He's my retreat. He's my sanctuary. He's my stronghold. And why in the world do we not go to him more often? Because if he's the retreat and he's the sanctuary and he's the place of refuge and we get out in the middle of all the chaos in this world and we're like, well, I don't know what to do. I guess I'll just go get a coffee. Let's go to the refuge. Let's go to the place of safety. Let's go to the rock of our salvation. God is my refuge. When times get tough, I can go to the rock and I will be saved from the storms of trouble. God says that he is almighty, the strongest and most powerful. He is impenetrable and impassable. In our world, it, seem, it seems that each time someone creates something that's some product or build a structure that's meant to, to be impenetrable or, or formidable, someone else creates some, something capable of destroying that or, or being able to get through the walls. Part of being recipients of God's protection is living close enough to him that we can be covered by his metaphorical wings. In Psalm 91, verses 4 through 7, we see where he has promised protection from nighttime and daytime evils. That pretty much covers the whole day. But in verse 4, it says this of God. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. The Hebrew words imply both defensive protection and an offensive weapon. Both offensive and defensive strength. That's why I like to walk around with him. He can defend, but he can also go on the offense. Like, we'll get this done, we'll take care of it. He takes that surly guy, just like using the word surly today, he takes that surly guy and he puts him in handcuffs. Take care of the problem, gone. When God steps into your situation, when we dwell in the refuge, in that place of safety, and we face some situation, God's like, I got it, I got it, I got it. Because you're depending on me, I've got it. So many times we don't, we're, we're outside that protective barrier and we're just like, yeah, I can do this, I can handle it. And all of a sudden we get slapped upside the head and like, oh my goodness, maybe I can handle it. Get into the place of safety. I want you to leave here today with a renewed vision of the God that fights your battles. He's not some washed up boxer who's seen the glory days pass him by still clinging to some trophy he won 20 years ago. He's still on the throne and there is no one that's ever going to remove him from that throne. Ever, ever, ever. God is my refuge and strength. My refuge and strength. Strength is the quality or state of being strong, mental power, force or vigor, moral power, firmness or courage, a power by reason of influence, authority and resources. That's my God. I don't know what God you're serving, but that's my God. He's my refuge and strength. He's strong mentally. He's got force. He's got vigor. He's got moral power. He's got courage. He's got influence. And he's got resources. The supply chain from heaven to here has not been interrupted. God's not walking around like, I don't know. I don't know. We, we've got vehicles that don't have chips. We can't do anything. That's not happening in heaven right now. God's not having angels scramble and try to, try, hey, we got to build some manufacturing facilities right here in heaven because we, no, that's not happening. The resources of heaven will never run dry. God is my refuge and my strength. He's my resource. He's strong. He's got force. He's got courage. Say it. Say it. That's my God. Do you believe it? A few of you do. Let's say it again. I'm not real convinced. You got to have it down in here. Because the enemy, it's one thing for me to come and say, hey, say that's my God. But when the devil comes to you tomorrow, and he's like, hey, I'm going to drill down on you. I'm going to slam you. I'm going to beat your head upside the wall. 
you better be able to say, no, no, not today, because my God is my refuge and my strength. He's my salvation. You got to get it inside. It can't be something you live. I cannot live on my mother and father's coattails. I can't live off of their prayers. I got to get it for myself. I got to get it for myself. He's my refuge. How strong is he? God is the greatest, most powerful, and perfect being that exists. God created the universe from nothing. We see that in Hebrews 11 and 3. Simply by speaking, Genesis 1. And I love coffee. I would love to be sitting at my desk and just go, coffee be there. And there it is. That, that would be awesome. Good cinnamon roll with like the real gooey stuff stuff just be like cinnamon roll be there and there it is absolutely has anybody ever been able to do that like you said and then like now I'm not talking about I'm not talking about somebody went and got it for you after you said it I'm talking about you said it and there it was is that God, I need you right now in the midst of my present problem. That's how, that's how great God is. Simply by speaking, the universe appeared. Boom. There it is. And today, everything continues to exist only because God continues to sustain it. We see that in Acts 17 and 28. He alone is the great and mighty God, Jeremiah 32 and 18, whose greatness is unsearchable. We can, we can certainly search the greatness of humanity. Different people that have been so great on earth, we can search, we can see it, history shows it. But you cannot search the greatness of God. We don't know the depths of his greatness. Another passage that explains that God is the greatest is in Hebrews. Chapter number 6, verses 13 and 14 says, For when God made a promise to Abraham... Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. The argument of these verses goes like this. Do you remember how when God promised to bless Abraham, God swore an oath to confirm his promise? Well, normally when someone swears by an oath, they got to swear by somebody greater than them. But notice in that verse, God swore by himself. So obviously, there's nobody greater than God. There's nobody greater. He swore by himself. So to answer the question, what makes God so powerful, we must simply say, nothing makes God powerful. He just is powerful. God is just powerful. That's his nature. After all, if, if something or someone needed to make God powerful, then they would be greater. But that's not the case. God is powerful all by himself. God is my, the creator. God is my refuge and strength. God, the creator, the ruler of the universe. God is my refuge and strength. Not the train conductor, not the mechanic, not your lawn care professional, not the electrician that fixed your latest power outage. My God, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, he is my refuge and strength. I hope somebody gets it today because I personally am very excited about the fact that God is my refuge, a very present help. Most of you said you had present problems. Music, get ready. Most of you said you have very present problems today. Those of you who don't, you, didn't either, you either didn't hear my question or maybe you're living in a dream world. God with us, God with us, a very present God for this very present problem that I'm dealing with. It was not a mistake. It was not a mistake that as we read through the what we call the Christmas story, that he was named Emmanuel God with. That was not a mistake. He was the present God. He'd been through time. He's, he, he's been from, from the beginning to the end. He's already, he's already been there. He's in the future right now waiting, but yet he's right here. He's a present God. 
God is right here, right now, ready to deliver, to heal, to transform, to set free, to lift up, to overwhelm, to subdue your enemies. Whatever your very present problem is, He is very present to take care of that situation. If we could stand today. You've got right now problems, I've got a right now God. Right now. Right now. Right now. You don't have to, you don't have to wait till next week. You, you don't have to wait till Wednesday. You don't have to wait till tomorrow afternoon. Right now, God. Right now, God. You rolled up in here with problems, but you don't have to roll out of here with problems. If you do, it's on you. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. He himself, speaking of God, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Because of that, we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. God, I need a job. God, I need a healing. God, I need a relationship mended. God, I've got a very present problem. And I need you to be very present in my situation. Today. 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 I want you to get it deep down today. In the midst of all the trembling and shaking in the earth, people running scared, don't ever think that God has abandoned his post. Don't ever think he's hiding somewhere. Don't ever think he's like, I don't know what to do. Maybe, maybe I'll gather the angels together. Maybe they'll know what to do. God is my refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. If you've got any trouble in your life today, any trouble, don't leave here without coming to talk to the refuge and strength. The very present God for your very present problem. Heavenly Father, right now, God, I'm asking, Lord Jesus, as we're finishing out this day in the house of God, because we're going to go out there this week and we're going to share Jesus with the world. But before we do, God, we've got some problems that need taken care of. We've got some situations, God. We've come, Lord, not to the physician, but to the healer. We've come, Lord Jesus, to you because we know that you can handle whatever it is we bring to you. You're not surprised by anything. You're not shocked by anything. God, you're not scratching your head wondering, how am I going to deal with this that they're presenting to me? God, we come to you, Lord, with open hearts. We come to you, Lord Jesus, bearing our soul. We come to you telling you today, this is my problem, and I need you to take care of it. God, touch us today as we pray. Touch us today as we seek your face. Let your spirit flow down upon us. God, let there be liberty in the house today to receive what we need from you. Oh, God, not just for blessing's sake, but, God, so that we can be a testimony to the refuge and strength of our soul so that when we talk to people out there that are, that are facing difficulties, we can tell them, I've got somebody you need to talk to. God, touch us today. Move on us today. Minister to us today. Oh, God, touch right now, Lord. Touch right now. These altars are open. God is moving. If you've got a problem, if you've got a problem, if you raise your hand, you got a problem, make sure you get it taken care of today. Don't walk out of here still carrying the problem. God is my refuge and strength. God is my refuge and strength. God is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. My healer. My deliverer. my glory and the lifter of my head oh God touch right now Jesus touch right now Jesus oh I've got problems Jesus I've got situations that I don't know what to do I'm perplexed I'm pressed on every side oh God touch me today Jesus touch me today Jesus touch me today Jesus touch me today Jesus Oh, God, move upon me today, Jesus. 
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.
great. How great is our God. Hallelujah. Let's, let's worship him right now. God, you are great and greatly to be praised. There is no other like you in all the earth, oh God. Lord, your train fills the temple. Your victories fill the temple. You are our refuge and strength. Oh, God, you're present right now in this moment. Oh, God, touch, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Touch in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. God is our refuge. He's our strength. He's our help. He's whatever you need him to be today. Whatever you need him to be today, he can be that for you. Praise God. Thank you for being here, for responding to the presence of God and worship the word of God. Looking forward to, as we journey through this year, God doing great things, stirring the waters of baptism, filling people with the Holy Spirit. That's not just a, that's not just a book of Acts thing. It's right now. It's right now. It's right now. The Holy Spirit is right now. Praise God. Praise God. As you go this week, share Jesus. Share Jesus. Your test, your personal testimony. Some of you have some amazing testimonies, and we all have a testimony because we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, but here we stand justified before God because of his redemption, because of the death of Jesus on the cross. I'm so thankful for that today. Share Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. If you're not happy about living for Jesus, you need to pray through. through if you're not happy about living for Jesus because it is the best relationship you could ever have praise God praise God Wednesday night third week of our prayer walk and having a wonderful wonderful time wonderful move of God please be here to pray seven to eight prayer walk seven to eight Wednesday Wednesday seven to eight the prayer walk by the way, on Wednesday night, we have a prayer walk from 7 to 8. Just in case you, 7 to 8. Just, yeah, 7 to 8. Just in case you didn't hear, didn't know, didn't know that it happened. It's our third week, Wednesday, this Wednesday. Thank you. God bless you. Greet one another. Have a great Sunday. In Jesus' name.